Hey guys, welcome to ProTech. I'm Steven, and welcome back to those of you who have been following us as we review the SIG P365. We've got about 5,000 rounds on our model right now, and uh, it was produced in January of 2018. And I've uh, just cleaned it up, and I'm going to fire five shots through it. We're going to look at the striker drag, and then we're going to do uh, a more in-depth review of all the, the gun's components including the striker. We're going to look look at the striker tip. So I'm going to take five shots. Okay. All good. Upper thoracic hits at about 13 yards. Barrel's got 5,000 rounds in it. Okay. We'll collect the brass. Nice and toasty. Let's go in. Actually, we've got one more in here. I got a headlamp now for those of you who are wondering. I had one, I just didn't use it last time. Okay. So, here's the brass. Go ahead and take this off. In case you're wondering what rig I carry it in, I carry it in one of our Kybrid holsters. It is a, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, we make these here at ProTech. It is a, uh, we call it a Kybrid meaning it's uh, kind of the best of both worlds of a, of a Kydex holster and a hybrid holster. We use premium horsehide leather for our backer, and then we have Kydex on both sides of the gun, fully covering the gun. So it gives really proper retention, consistent retention throughout the life of the holster. Very comfortable. I mean, it's so comfortable you almost forget that you're wearing it. It forms to your body. We treat both sides of the leather, burnish it, do the whole, you know, the whole deal. Uh, it's Kydex 100. It's the strongest Kydex on the market. We use thicker Kydex on the outside than we do on the inside. And uh, it's just a very quality product. But that's what I carry it in. Okay. All right. So we're empty. Okay. And uh, we're going to go ahead and break the gun down. Take these off. Sorry if I was yelling. I'm going to go ahead and break the gun down and take a look at the inside. And then we'll also look at the striker drag. Actually, let's go ahead and look at the striker drag now. now like I said, this gun was manufactured uh, January 21st of 2018. Okay. It's been a long day. Been down here making holsters all day and doing r and I'm doing some work for a gun company out west. I do contracted engineering work in the gun industry now. Uh, on a uh, consulting basis. Okay, so the striker drag looks about the same as it did uh, when we got the gun with about 3,000 rounds on it. Taking it to a few few IDPA competitions, few bowling pin competitions, done some training here in our training academy at ProTech with it. I've uh, loaned it uh, or, or let, let a few of our range patrons shoot it. We're a public shooting range here in Brazil, Indiana. Um, anyways, yeah, the striker drag looks about the same as it did last time. You can still see, you can still see some, here's probably the worst one. You can still see some uh, drag. I'll, I'll overlay a, a picture of it on the video for you guys to see. But being that the gun, and, and some of you commented, and you're, you're right, uh, being that the gun is so small and compact, they don't have as much room to unlock it, to take more distance, more slide travel to unlock it. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the P365 unlocks very quickly after just a little bit of slide movement. If I put this side by side with, say, a Glock 17, actually, let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and do that just to show you guys what, what I'm talking about. Oh, 
Okay, so Glock 17, this is a Gen 5 Glock 17, of course we're unloaded. Okay. The slide will move rearward on it. A good, almost a quarter of an inch before it fully unlocks. And then the SIG P365 will move just, just right at the initial rearward movement of the slide. It's already unlocked. So it's unlocking in, uh, I want to say, probably about half that distance, maybe an eighth of an inch. So uh, that being said, that could explain why the striker is dragging some on the on the primer because <clears throat> under pressure uh, this thing is is being scraped down the breech face of the back of the slide where the where the striker protrudes and uh, it's got a little return spring on it uh, the striker does to to help pull it back out of uh, the, uh, the the striker tip pocket um, in the in the breech face, but it doesn't quite do it fast enough, and sometimes it'll drag on the primer. And we've noticed this with some of our other smaller uh, micro class pistols as well. So it really, again, just just like just like we said a few thousand rounds ago, uh, not really a concern. Um, I understand uh, Sig earlier on had some issues with um, with some striker tips breaking, but that probably was, was due to a bad batch of strikers, just like I said in the previous video. All right, so let's take this part, and I'm going to go ahead and pull the chassis out for, for those of you that wanted me to last time. But first... Everybody seems to be hating on the most about this gun. Haters gonna hate. Moment of truth. Removing the spring cups. There we go. None of them launch through the atmosphere. That's good. Put a hole in the ceiling. All right. So again, there's the little. There's the little striker return spring I was referring to. And the striker tip looks uh, the same as it did a couple thousand rounds ago. We shot, uh, shot a few different loads through it. Some factory ammo, some uh, reloads that are probably in the 127, 128 power factor area, and then some that are in about the 140 power factor area for when we're shooting bowling pins a little bit more momentum but uh, strikers still holding strong I can still see the parting line from the MIM process on it um, I see I want to say no wear on it even on the tip I see I see no wear on this striker <clears throat> a very robust piece and they've probably they've probably nitrocarburized uh, this this component and some of the other ones as well. Um, nitrocarburizing, there's I don't know a few dozen different uh, processes that that uh, will give you a nitrocarburized finish. But anyways, this is this is a, a grade of steel that has probably been hardened, uh, you know, fairly hard, but not hard enough that it that it's brittle. Uh, so it's it's got a hard outer shell, uh, partially from the heat treatment, but even more so that that heat treated uh, piece has a very hard nitrocarburized shell on the outside of it. It's almost like a like an eggshell, if you will. Um, on the outside of it that uh, gives it 68 plus 
Rockwell C, and that's a very hard, very hard component. Uh, I'd, I'd say, I don't know what that would be on a B scale, I'll put that on the screen. <clears throat> but, yeah, no concerns whatsoever with the striker. And again, this one was manufactured January 21st of 2018. Um, I assume this is uh, from a good batch of strikers because the, if this would have broken, it would have broken rather quickly. Like uh, the few that 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 broke uh, and people uh, made videos about them. Um, so yeah, no concerns whatsoever with the striker barrel. Barrel uh, the, the rifling in the barrel. Looks just fine. This is probably another nitrocarburized component. They also call it melanite. Several different names. Um, minimal wear there. I can see a little spot where the where the spring, where the guide rod assembly will rub against it. Uh, yeah, the uh, the unlocking surface here that interacts with the chassis to unlock the barrel from the slide. Uh, it has a little bit of polishing on it. Um, the chamber chamber is, is you, you can tell that it's polished. And on a nitrocarburized finish, what will happen on these black finishes, nitride, nitrocarburized, melanite, a lot of different names for it, the black will wear off, but the hard shell is still there. Um, it's kind of similar to um, uh, how, uh, like, a manganese phosphate will will rub off, um, uh, or um, what's another good one? You know, let's just stick with that. It it's uh, the the black is more, <laughs> I want to say, aesthetics, the the appearance. That also would explain why they didn't pay for that to be done on the striker because the striker is an internal component and it can be shiny if it needs to be. Uh, whereas to get the black costs a little bit more money in the process. And they're manufacturing a, a product and they want to save, you know, as, as much as they can without sacrificing any quality uh, in the product. So, but the rifling looks great. Uh, the barrel is still, I mean, I see nowhere, nowhere in the chamber area. The feed ramp, feed ramp is nice and smooth. Very impressed. The front, the front unlocking surface is polished, but there's no peening whatsoever, no deformation, no rounding off of, of any edges. Holding strong. Guide rod assembly looks good. It's a two-stage system. The, re the felt recoil on it is is uh, pretty pleasant. <clears throat> the back plate's a back plate. It's another MEM component. Metal. Striker spring looks just fine. It's got a little bit of a curve to it, but. And that might be because it is so much bigger in diameter than the striker. But I imagine SIG had to do that in order to get enough striker force, uh, enough enough momentum uh, on the striker body itself to properly indent the primer. And we've got good indentation on these. You can see a little bit of variation, but not much. There's the striker cup with the, the little what the striker rides in. The back end of it keeps it keeps it from rotating. Keeps the striker from rotating so that the sear surface on the striker can interact with the sear on the on the trigger bar, if you will call it. Now we'll call it the trigger sear because it's it's disconnected from the bar that actuates the sear. The sear just pivots downward off of this 
striker and allows the striker to go forward off of it. All right, um, let's take a look at the plunger kind of got stuck in there. There we go. So the uh, the drop safety looks just fine. Another NIMD nitrocarburized component, and you can see where it, it has worn off some of the coating on it, on the body. But uh, again, no deformation uh, that I can tell. It looks like where the, where the, uh, let's see, that's on this side. So where this little piece here, when you pull the trigger and it, it pivots up, that little piece just to the right of the sear, and that pivots up, it pushes this up into the slide, and it allows the striker to pass through it. Through it that way. <laughs> um, looks like where that makes contact there might be a, a little bit of a break edge there, and I didn't I didn't uh, look at it closely at 3,000 rounds to see if that um, had that break edge there or not. That might be a machined edge just to give the trigger a bit more smooth of, a, of an appeal. Okay. Now the extractor is installed via a, a coil pin. Um, which can be removed and reinstalled, but it's probably best to leave that in there. But I'm going to take it out so you guys can see it. I use a vise and, and I actually use some of our horse hide to make vise jaws. So I don't mar the finish on any of my guns. There's a little coil pin, a little spring pin. Okay, so then the extractor. Again, another MEM component. We're seeing a trend here. And it's smart, really. I would MEM as many gun components as I could because it's a very efficient, uh, robust process. It, pro it produces a, a robust part when done properly. And I have no complaints with this particular gun. Uh, I can see a little bit of wear on it where it's worn through the black, but uh, still a very hard component. The extractor edge, I have no concerns there. Nice, nice radius. It's functioning properly. This gun, when it's, when it's fed good ammo, uh, you know, good factory ammunition or, or properly reloaded ammunition. Uh, it just, it works. I'm still not carrying it um, yet, but uh, I intend to most likely carry it. I want to get a light for it, a weapon light. Uh, the extractor spring is, is a very, uh, very stout spring, and they even uh, supplemented it with a little polymer plunger like what's seen in an, in an AR-15 extractor, some of them, where there's a little polymer rubber plug in the middle of the spring just to give it a little bit more spring force, a little bit more force. Okay. Really, my only complaint with this gun so far, and I do intend to send it back to SIG to have the updates done on it because this is pre-update. Uh, where it's it's still got the uh, the original sights, where I believe it's green in the back and maybe yellow or orange in the front. The front sight has completely stopped glowing. I can see no glow from it whatsoever. The rear sights still glow nicely, um, which really and truly I mean, we, we do a lot of low light training here and and 
it's very difficult to safely uh, to, to be sure of your target without a light. And when you're using a light, you don't really need night sights because it backlights your sights. You know, the light lights up the surface that you're shining it at. And, uh, you know, then you see the contrast of your front and rear sight. You can line them up perfectly whether you got night sights or not. To be honest, if you're, and if your light is bright enough and the object is close enough, you can't even see the night sights glowing. Same thing with, you know, with my Glocks that have night sights on them. But I am going to send it back to him and have him put the new sights on it uh, and then do whatever other updates uh, that, they're, uh, that they're supposed to do to it. Um, and they may find it interesting to see one with this many rounds on it. I don't know. Uh, we did start keeping a round count on it uh, once we got over 5,000 rounds. So we're keeping a round count and a, and a maintenance log on it. Okay, so let's get this chassis out of here. See, it's got a pin right there. And most guns, most guns, unless it's a unless it's a, a spring pin, a coil pin like this one, you should be able to push the push the pins out, the trigger block pin, or like the pins on your Glock frame. You should be able to push those out with just your hand and a punch. You know, you might want to wiggle the component forward or back. Like on a Glock, you can wiggle the, the, uh, the, slide, the slide lock forward or back a little bit to get it to line up with the body of the pin because it'll have little grooves on it like this one does. This one's got a groove here and a groove here that probably mates up. Yeah, there's a little spring inside this hole that goes in that groove to retain the pin, keep it from sliding out. <coughs> Okay, so there's the there's the chassis and there's the grip. Now, I haven't uh, I haven't researched to see what other grips they have available, um, if any, for this gun. I, I believe that they would have other grips available, being that it's a chassis gun, or maybe they will in the future. But this grip fits my hand great. Uh, I really like it. And here's the chassis. I notice with with some chassis guns, uh, the, the the chassis itself is somewhat intricate with all the springs and and um, features that it has, and uh, can be difficult to disassemble with just basic tools: hammer, punch, vise. Um, in the factory, they probably have a lot of really nice fixturing to take these apart. So I wouldn't recommend I wouldn't recommend taking this apart uh, outside of popping the pin out. And they have designed this to easily remove the pin and pull the chassis out, probably to clean it. But um, they probably do not intend on we the users uh, tearing the chassis itself down any past that. I can see one, two, three, four, four or five springs in this. Basically, one per component, and some of them are pretty stout. Um, so I, I would not recommend taking this apart. Yes, I could I could take this apart right now, but um, I have no need to. And to be honest. Sometimes we do more wear and tear to our guns, excessively stripping them down, uh, than we would just maybe tearing it down to this point. See, I can get to most everything with a brush and a can of CLP or, or brake parts cleaner or mineral spirits or whatever you use to clean your gun or your dishwasher. Um, I know some guys will tear their gun down, put it in the basket, and put it put it in the dishwasher, or they have an old dishwasher they may do it with. Your wife might hurt you if you put it in a nice brand new dishwasher. If you do that, it's not my fault. Um, yeah, I'm impressed. A lot of mem components here. I mean, this this the majority of this gun is memmed aside from the barrel and the slide. Um, you know, the, the the chassis is memmed. You know, the controls are, are mostly all mimmed. 
I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least nine component ten. At least ten components that are mimmed on this gun. And to be honest, like I said, like I've said before a few times, when I see a gun like this that's that's got a lot of uh, mimmed components, a new age gun that has a lot of mimmed components in it, that that really is embracing the future uh, now. And uh, uh, you know, I, I I applaud Sig for for doing that for putting all of these mem components in this gun because the the mem process if if all of these were machined not only would the gun cost a lot more uh, but the parts would not be as strong uh, because the mem process flows molten metal it's metal injection molding it flows molten metal into a cavity Okay, and so that, that metal flows with the geometry of the part, whatever the part may be. And that is, grain structure-wise, it will produce a stronger component than machining that component from a piece of stock, of bar stock, of round or rectangular square bar stock. Because in, in bar stock, the grain is all running one way, and then you cut the geometry out of it, and it's it's almost like, you know, cutting a piece of wood, depending on how you cut the piece of wood, it uh, can, can lose a lot of strength. That's why certain cuts are made with the grain in a certain orientation so that the thing doesn't break. Okay, same, same thing with, with components like these. So we can get away with making, with making lighter weight components, uh, with, with not having to beef up the material as much. Uh, because now the grain, the grain structure is flowing with the geometry of the part. So then you can you can get away with making a, a much smaller, more compact pistol that'll really go for a lot of rounds. Um, I, like I said, I've 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 been pleased with this gun for the most part. Um, my only complaint is the night sights, and uh, like I said, I'm gonna partake in shipping it back to Sig. At some point, I believe, um, and get that fixed. So now we're going to put it back together. Make sure your chassis looks right. Pop it down in the hole, maybe. Should just slide down in there. There we go. Okay, so I kind of put the front end first, and then the back. And then the pin should should just slide in. Put it in on the, the right side, the side where the spring is. And just take the back end of your punch, push it till it's flush. It's even on both sides. Okay. And the extractor. And this is another component that, unless you're having issues with extraction, I'd probably just leave it in the slime. Just brush it, brush what you can, because the majority of the buildup on an extractor is on the is on the, the the hook itself, the part that pulls the spent shell casing or the or the cartridge out of the chamber. And back here where it pivots and everything, and and back here where the spring pushes, you're not really going to much build up or debris. Okay, so we'll drop that down in here. And it's probably best to, oh yeah, definitely, definitely best to, if you do disassemble this, when you reassemble it, put the roll pin in through the top of the slide 
they've uh, they've done a nice uh, countersink to help guide the uh, the roll pin down into its pocket. Don't try to insert it from the inside because it's uneven surfaces and you'll probably mangle up the pin and have to get a new one. And then explain to SIG's customer service over the phone why you had to take your extractor out. So it's probably best just just leave it in the gun. You don't have to take everything apart. Okay. So and if you got it, if you got it, um, it's probably best to use a uh, a roll pin starter punch. Um, I've got some, but they're not handy. And then I'm going to go ahead and use my vise to compress the, the spring and just give me kind of a third hand. A lot of times you can get away with basic tools, hammer, punches, maybe screwdriver, and a vise, because the vise will kind of serve as, as third hand for you. And remember light taps. You don't want to wail on it. If you're having to really wail on something, it's probably not lined up or it's got something engaged on it. I've seen I've seen guys wail on Glock pins because the uh, the little spring or the uh, the, the slide lock is is inside of that groove in that pin. They're just wailing on it. And that's how you tear stuff up. Just drive it drive it in there to where it's sub flush, both inside and out. And uh, it's got, you know, good engagement both sides. You could probably drive it a little deeper from the top. Just tap it in. And your punch, your punch will uh, will bottom out in the bottom of that countersink, or it can, depending on what size punch you're using. Okay, so let's reassemble the striker assembly. Okay, so when reassembling this, I'm going to put this spring on the striker. This is the little spring that that pulls the striker back out of the breech face. Okay. Like that. Okay, and I will use the slide on its side. I do the same thing with a Glock when I disassemble a Glock. I'll use the slide on its side. It's kind of a way to field strip, if you will. If you had to do this out in the field, you could. And, and just, it's a convenient way to do it. You don't want to do it with it on, on the top because you're applying force downward on the side and the slide will tip over. And then your spring and your spring cups will go shooting through the air. And then you'll spend the next 15 minutes trying to find it, if you find it, depending on how shop floor is. Most of our shop floors aren't all that clean. Okay, I'm just assuming that. I'm not judging. Okay, so then put the spring on there, get your spring cups in position, and I, I will rest my hand on the slide and compress the spring so the slide won't slip out from underneath the striker. First cup in there, and get it lined up. That way, if my thumb does happen to slip, that one cup will hopefully keep the spring from shooting it off into oblivion. Okay, and then there we go. That's assembled. Okay, and before you put that in, put the uh, little trigger safety back in there. Safety, not trigger safety, drop safety. Okay. All right. And then your back plate. There we go. Okay, it's fully 
in the slide itself, uh, you know, I can see some polishing on the inside here, on the bottom side of the unlocking surface, and then a little polishing there. This is probably nitrocarburized as well. Nice smooth finish. Nitrocarburizing is it leaves kind of a semi-gloss um, finish, and, and it also depends on the, the surface finish of the part before it was coated. Um, but uh, and then here at the, the barrel hole, you can see a decent amount of polishing on the top of it in here. I'd consider this gun broken in now. I don't know how many rounds uh, it uh, it was put or subjected to when Sig developed it, but I would I would bet a buffalo nickel, and I've got a few of them, uh, that this gun would probably easily go 20,000 rounds. I don't see any cracking. In the frame or in the in the, the chassis, um, the chassis concept is nice, really is. Chassis guns are are, uh, and to be honest, chassis guns may end up becoming more and more common. There's a lot of companies that are probably working on those in one form or another. Assemble it. Make sure that the uh, the little bar that disengages the drop safety is pushed down. And then you gotta hold your mouth just right sometimes. I notice the uh, takedown cam on mine sometimes is, is finicky. There we go. Okay. So, just use your ear. Push the, uh, push the slide lock up. And that will allow you to rotate the slide take down bar down. Just hold that down because it's kind of on spring force and it'll it'll pop back up there. So hold it down. And there we go. And mind you, uh, that uh, function test out there was shooting the gun completely dry. I don't normally do that. Uh, but I had I had just cleaned it and I got it. It had a bunch of carbon buildup in it. It was it was quite dirty. Um, but uh, I took it all apart and uh, soaked it in some soapy water, uh, some uh, Dawn dish soap greasy uh, yeah, degreasing de mixture, if you will, nice and hot. And then uh, took it out and, and wiped all the debris off of it and brushed it off and then uh, cleaned the barrel out nicely and uh, put it all together and that's when we did this function test. But the trigger on it just feels amazing. The best way to do a trigger job on a gun is dry fire it or shoot it. And that's what I've done with this one and it's one of the best triggers that I've got. So, Sig, good job. I'll be sending this back to you at some point. Uh, possibly to get a a new site on it, or I might just ask you to ship them to me and I'll install them here at my shop. But hope you all have enjoyed the video. This is kind of a laid back, laid back uh, video. Most of our videos are a lot shorter than this, but um, this gun is getting a lot of, a lot of reviews, and um, it's had a lot of negativity thrown at it, and. Uh, I think I think a large majority of that is is bullcrap. So, um, and if that hurts your feelings, then I mean, 
That's your problem, not mine. Uh, I tend to go off of data, and the user surveys of this gun uh, show the vast majority of users are happy with its performance, and a very small percentage have had issues. Um, and this is probably one of the higher round count, maybe one of the highest uh, round count SIG P365s that's out in circulation. We have, we have not taken it easy on this gun. We've put it through the ringer, and uh, it has done quite well. I don't have uh, nearly as many rounds on my shield, uh, Smith Wesson shield with a TLR-6 on it. I don't have nearly as many rounds on it, and I can tell that, that uh, it's, not, it's not a 20,000-round gun, uh, whereas this, this very well could be. Um, so... And you get what you pay for. This this thing is almost twice as much money as a shield. You know, and it's got uh, several pros over it, but you're paying more money. And uh, ideally, the more you pay, the better the product. It doesn't always work out that way. But, um, you know, I, I'm a big a big supporter of, of quality products that work well. Just like with our holsters, you know, these come with a lifetime guarantee, and uh, some of our rigs have been through a lot of wear and tear, a lot of abuse, and you know they're still out there rocking and rolling. Our main T and E guy, he weighs 300, 350 pounds, and works construction down in Florida, and he wears one of our rigs on his hip he carries a glock 19 with a with a weapon light on it and then a dual mag pouch one of our iwb magazine pouches in the other side or on the other side and uh sweats on it and beats it up every day and he's one of two individuals that has broken the kydex on it and we use kydex 100 um so it's a very very robust product we had another guy wreck his motorcycle and he slid down the road on it. Not only did it protect his gun, but it also protected his hip from possibly being broken because it dispersed the pressure. That's the advantage of, of a hybrid a hybrid design with a quality piece of leather. Now, we use, we use premium leather, uh, thick horse hide. It's 10 ounces thick, so it's uh, 3 sixteenths or more an inch thick. And, uh, and we tuck it up nice and close to the body. It's very concealable and very comfortable. Uh, and, it, and it should outlast uh, the, the, the carrier's desire to carry that pistol. Um, and we've been doing it for uh, over five years now. And we have yet to have one customer uh, mail it back to us because he, he or she was dissatisfied. And we've made several improvements on uh, on the design since day one. This is uh, generation eight or nine now, and uh, it's it's gotten it's gotten pretty robust, and it's gotten just about where it needs to be. So, but once we learn something new, we incorporate it into the design because that's what that's what design work is about, and that's what having a a, a top notch product is about. It's, consistently and continually improving uh, the design. Now, not all improvements will make it into production immediately. You know, some improvements may be stacked onto one another or might get rolled into the next generation, kind of like what Glock did you know, with, with the Gen 5 series. I think they did close to 20 improvements on this gun from Gen 4 to Gen 5. And you can really tell. I mean, the trigger right out of the box is is amazing in comparison to Gen 3s and Gen 4s. Um, it used to be, if, if you wanted a nice smooth trigger like what you get in a stock Gen 5, you'd, you'd have to do a, a little work to it to get a Gen 3 or a Gen 4 there. You know? And then several other features. This, this video isn't about Glocks, so I'm not going to get into that, but... If if you're if you're concerned about a you know a P365 for any reason, um, I would go off the data. What is what are the users saying? Uh, what are professionals saying about it? You know, I am a professional, and I I I believe that this is a this is a solid platform. Would I would I bet my life on it uh, without SIGs updates, whatever they want to do to it? 
I don't know. I mean, I if I didn't know about all the hype uh, or lack thereof or the continuous repassing around of of so so called issues with the gun, I probably would say yes. Um, but the only reason why I am hesitant uh, is because this is a an earlier production gun. I believe it is January of 2018. It's almost a year old. Um, Ten months. Um, you know, and will it have an issue? I don't know. But I would venture to say that at 5,000 rounds, it would have it would have hit the surface if it were going to have an issue. So. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I apologize if it was too long for you. You probably didn't make it this long anyways. You probably cut it off. But um, if you have any uh, any questions that you uh, would like for me to answer or try to answer, uh, please uh, leave a comment in the comment area. Um, or if you've got another gun that, that uh, you'd like for me to review, you know, the Glock 43 or the, the Shield 9mm or another another micro class carry gun or a full size gun or whatever uh, if we've got it in stock here at Protech or one of our patrons does or the company happens to send us one for review we'll review it and we'll put it up for you but stay safe out there guys and we'll see you next time